Hey Ape Scholars, welcome to our ninth and final FRQ Friday video. If you're watching this video right when it was posted, the 2023 Apes exam is just three days away. But don't worry, this is one of the most useful videos that you could be spending your precious final hours of studying time on because FRQs are 40% of the exam and this one covers unit nine, which happens to be 15 to 20% of the exam. Now, before we get started, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you don't miss my upcoming exam review live streams Sunday and Monday night from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Now for this final FRQ video, we had one of our busiest weeks of submissions yet. Shout out to Buse, Ryan, Mariah, Alexander, and Vedanch for submitting their FRQs this week. And I also want to give a shout out to the Ape Scholars of Virginia Episcopal High School, along with their teachers, Mr. Bright and Mr. Picard. Now, before we get into scoring our practice FRQ for this week, I want to give an extra special Ape shout out to Vedanch, who in addition to being an Ape Scholar is also a fellow YouTube educator. If you're looking for some interesting ideas about trigonometry or history or even Ape shorts or dance moves, check his channel out and give him some scholarly support. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming here. The practice FRQ that we'll be scoring comes to us from Alexander, so thank you for submitting your FRQ and allowing us to learn from it. Now, before we actually score this FRQ, can we just admire this immaculate handwriting for a second? Remember that real teachers like myself have to interpret your responses, so try to bring out your best penmanship for this once in a year occasion where it really counts. In part A, Alexander split the two available points. He's correct in determining the concentration of CO2 as 300 80 parts per million, but unfortunately he was just a bit below the accepted range for pH at 8.02. Now remember that on the exam, you can use the edge of another piece of paper like a ruler to trace a straight line up from the x-axis to figure out exact values on graph-based questions like this. Now in part B, Alexander improved on his 50% accuracy so far, picking up three out of the four available points. First, by stating that the concentration of CO2 in the ocean will increase due to an increase in atmospheric CO2 levels. And second, for describing how increasing atmospheric CO2 levels cause the pH of the ocean water to decrease. And third, for correctly providing the balanced equation for CO2 and H2O, forming carbonic acid or H2CO3. Now, unfortunately, on the fourth point here, Alexander just misinterpreted the prompt a little and described how a decrease in ocean pH causes shells to degrade, rather than just identifying that this decrease in ocean pH is known as ocean acidification. Now, I do have to say, I think this came across almost as too simple of a question to some students, but since it is an identify prompt, that's a clue that the prompt is really just looking for an individual phrase or concept instead of a description of an effect. In question C part one, Alexander is so, so close to earning the second bullet point on the rubric, but because he doesn't explicitly state that this decrease in availability of carbonate ions results in weakened shells or an inability to maintain shell growth, I erred on the side of caution and withheld this point. Now it is implied from his answer and it's possible that a reader in 2019 would have scored this point, but as viewers of this series know, I always err on the side of caution and withhold points when answers are implied rather than explicitly stated. A good rule of thumb to make sure that you avoid mistakes like this on the exam is to assume that your reader is never going to round up or make that final assumption to get to a correct answer, but that you always connect your answer back to the prompt with that final explicit statement. Now in C part two, I think Alexander was close enough to this second row on the rubric to earn both points since coral reef pieces certainly are sold in gift shops and online. And this of course does physically destroy the reef that's harvested. So with the final two points in part C here, Alexander ended up at a six out of 10 in this FRQ, which if we check out our APES exam score calculator, we can see puts him in great shape to earn a four on this exam, as long as his multiple choice score is in the 70% range. However, if he can get his multiple multiple choice scores up into the 80% range and keep his FRQ average at six across all three FRQs, he has a chance at sneaking into the five range on this year's exam. And remember that if you wanna predict your exam score this May, just hop down to the video description below, make yourself a copy of this exam score calculator and plug in your own FRQ and multiple choice scores. All right, Ape Scholars, that's it for the FRQ Friday series this year. Thank you so much for tuning in and especially to those of you who submitted your practice of our cues for scoring. This has been such an enjoyable way to get to know this APES community this year and I hope it's been an enjoyable way for you to improve your FRQ scores and feel more confident for that exam in May. Now, if you want two simple tricks to improve your FRQ scores in just a few days, click on this video right here. Or if you wanna watch my playlist breaking down the three different types of FRQs and how to go about writing each of those, click right here. Or if you click next, make sure you always remember to think like a mountain and write like a scholar.